Ah, how long have we got? A simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Richard, I think probably this falls to your bag to start. I thought you might say that, Mike. Um, well, as uh, the MP for the constituency that includes Lambourne, I, you can imagine I've had one or two letters on this uh, and emails on this subject. The emails are always more angry than the letters. Uh, <laughs> I would love to be able to sit here and say that a future Conservative government would get rid of the whole cost-sharing uh, nonsense. Um, but I have a voice in my head, and it's, I'm, if, it, if this doesn't sound too weird, it's George Osborne's. And he's stopped us all uh, giving any spending commitments that could possibly burden a future government, because there will be no money. So, uh, but in principle, actually, I'm not opposed to cost-sharing. I am opposed to the way it is proposing to be implemented in areas such as uh, the equine environment. Uh, I recognise that 65% of horse owners own one animal. A further 15%, I think, own two animals. So that's 80% own two animals or less. And the idea that you could create a bureaucracy that will, will be able to collect this tax across uh, a, a fairly diverse uh, uh, group of people across the whole country is, I think, uh, uh, probably going to cost more than it will actually achieve. So I prefer to look at it uh, at a much macro level. And I do also think that we need to look at uh, the impact that future possible equine diseases that uh, we know exist in other parts of the world, if they came here, the impact that would have, not just on the, on, on the organizations uh, or interests that you represent, but the economy as a whole. I mean, it, once the Grand National had to be canceled or the entire flat season or the 2012 Olympics because, of the, the, uh, because some disease has arrived here, we have to understand the impact that that is ha will have right across our tourism and our economy. Uh, so these are massive issues. And I do think the way we look at animal diseases in this country is wrong. And we, we, we have a very good uh, very well respected practice of looking at the whole biolo biology of pathogens. But in recent years, we've too, been too busy wanting to get a quick fix, and we told scientists to go in there and get a, uh, get, just deal with this problem without looking at the whole biology, the whole, uh, and that is the, the, what has made this, uh, UK science so respected around the world, and we have to go back to, to, to respecting that. And it's got a cost to it, and it's got a cost to it that, that we ha have to impose fairly. But I am not uh, going to be, if we are in the gov in government, in the business of seeking to impose this uh, in a completely bureaucratic and impossible way across uh, groups of people who own one or two horses. Richard, thank you. What with the veterinary profession view, Sadie? Well, uh, I, I, won't, I can't speak for the entire veterinary profession. I mean, I think this is a difficult uh, problem, and, and uh, the working party that are looking at it have only just uh, started, and I would, would urge those here who have views to feed those into Rosemary Ratcliffe, and Tim Morris is on the working party representing the equine industry. And I think whether or not horses are in or not is still a, a, a matter for discussion. I mean, I think, ironically, though, the point Richard made uh, about the potential national threat of the incursion of an exotic disease, maybe something like African horse sickness, West Nile virus, which has zoonotic potential, actually makes, strengthens the argument uh, for cost and responsibility sharing, which after all did come out of major uh, epidemic diseases like foot and mouth. Mom, as someone who has cattle, sheep, horses, your thoughts? Hmm. Um, I want to know what the cost of creating another government agency will be in terms of benefit. But um, no, I think there is an element of, of raising and the sense of responsibility. And it, it's slightly linked with what we were talking about with the breeding issue, I suspect, um, coming at it from a slightly uh, different point of view, that is a general sense of responsibility and identification. And, and the industry has tried through the databases to, to create that sense of responsibility by identifying everybody who has um, uh, horses so that there is a way of reaching them. Um, but I'm afraid the, the equine world has been extremely slow to take that voluntary offer up. And it may be that you're going to be whacked with a, um, a regulatory system instead. We've got to expect, I think, a system of uh, some kind of identification for, that you can trace that makes animals and horses traceable. Our farm livestock is so traceable that the sheep can hardly walk with the weight of kit on them, <laughs> uh, which seems to me to be a welfare issue in itself, but we won't worry. We'll go to far another. 
identification issues, but certainly a system that you can identify where horses are uh, and who owns them seems to be entirely reasonable. I just don't think this sounds very convincing in that respect, and I don't think people will buy into it. But it's partly our own faults. We haven't responded to the efforts that we've made ourselves to make our um, horses traceable and the owners traceable. Nick, have you got a comment? Well, is it right for the, for the taxpayer to foot the bill for our horses and for our animal disease? No, it's not. But is this government proposal necessarily the right thing? No, particularly when it comes to horses. Because what we've got, as Her Royal Highness was saying, is the creation of a quango. So more bureaucracy. And breaking down the responsibility between that quango and DEFRA, which you're still contributing to through your taxes. And the point is that horse owners don't receive the vast subsidies that large animal owners do. They don't receive subsidies uh, from Europe. Most horse owners aren't commercial breeders. There are some in thoroughbred industry who are, but most are not commercial breeders operating as a business. So they're going to be hit hardest. The people for whom owning a horse is a stretch, the young people that we're trying to encourage to ride as part of the um, mobility and activity of the 2012 project, they're going to be hit hard. I mean, from a racing standpoint, the Horse Race Betting Levy Board has a component for veterinary research which contributes um, to the study of exotic equine diseases. So you're paying for that already as a punter, an owner, and a breeder. And if you are a punter or a small owner and a breeder and fit all three of those categories, I figure you're paying three times over. Once through your income tax to DEFRA, once through the Quango, and once through the Horse Race Betting Levy Board. I'm not saying leave us alone, but I think DEFRA could take an example off the horse-owning community who, as has been said, do an awful lot to self-regulate and do an awful lot to make sure that the disease controls are in place. And I think that the pharma community could take a lesson um, from, the, from the equine community in this respect, and um, I support the campaign to rethink the horse tax. Richard, you want to come back? Just very quickly, I think Nick made a very important point there. Who, who would this hurt most? It won't hurt the, the Sheikh Mohammed. It, it will hurt the small, uh, the small livery stables in my constituency that have been they're finding life so difficult. They're hanging on by the fingernails. They've been hit by working time directive, by liability, liability issues, massive, uh, massive as a result of that recent court case. And now to have a, uh, you know, a, it could be the straw that breaks the camel back. And if we, want, if we want to encourage young people to get involved in riding and understanding horse care, these are the sort of places we should be encouraging people to go to. This will work against that. Yes, thank you for that. That's a good point. Now, I know we've got some interest in the floor, and I'm going to ask first the Deputy Chief Veterinary Officer from DEFRO is here with us, Alec Simmons. Alec, would you please make a comment? Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be brief. I know there's a lot to talk about. Um, I was very interested to hear some of the comments that have been made here this afternoon or this morning, and in particular uh, about uh, the responsibility and cost-sharing agenda, um, and in particular, um, how, how much interest there is. I would emphasize this is not a done deal. Uh, we expect to uh, publish a draft bill in uh, early next year, and there will be a great deal of opportunity for further discussion about this. But it is part of our agenda to uh, recreate a better relationship between animal keepers, animal owners, and government to make sure that the costs and uh, responsibility for dealing with animal disease is better shared between all of us. And whilst we've had very little exotic diseases of horses over the last few years, we got rid of glanders in 1928, and we've had no more exotic diseases since then, we're still faced with emerging threats. And uh, I note that two of the members have already talked about African horse sickness and West Nile fever. We have dealt with blue tongue, which is transmitted in the same way as African horse sickness. Uh, and that has come out of the blue, uh, so to speak, um, and we are having to deal with uh, emerging threats which threaten uh, horse industry, public health, and the economy, and we need a better way of dealing with it. So sharing responsibility offers the opportunity for animal keepers to take better responsibility, take greater responsibility uh, for decisions in the management of animal diseases, and uh, the proposals are quite clear about that. At the moment, as you already heard, uh, they are confined to England, uh, but we expect Scotland, Wales and Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland to come uh, in line over time, and the proposals from Europe are to work towards this harmonised across the whole of the EU over time. 
Um, I'd also commend that there's a, a great deal of work going on already. Uh, the uh, working group that uh, is preferred, chaired by uh, Brigadier Jepson has worked to develop with us an African horse sickness strategy, recognizing the threat, and that is something which will be uh, rolled out before too long, and I commend that as being a really good uh, uh, example of partnership where we can work better together. Alex, thank you. Uh, there are some more questions. Yes, Andrew. Uh, Mike, Mike uh, Andrew Finding, British Equestrian Federation. Um, I just wanted to make the point that under the leadership uh, of Tim Morris from British Horse Racing Authority and in his role as uh, chairman of the British Horse Industry Confederation, that the Rethink the Horse Tax uh, website has been created and a set of, uh, set of thought processes associated with that. I, I would like to refer the uh, the audience and, and the industry to the rethinkthehorsetax.co.uk website uh, to pick up issues on this subject and, and also to have a look at the, uh, the prospect of signing a petition that sits in the 10 Downing Street website uh, that asks the government to indeed rethink the horse tax. There has been some um, lack of enthusiasm to do that with only uh, 4,000 people signing the petition and I think as an industry if we are to be seen to be working together uh, that it would, really would be helpful uh, for individuals uh, to express their views, particularly in the context of uh, generating uh, another quanga. Thank you, Andrew. Any more people who'd like to comment on this? I appreciate this is one that could go on a while, so we need to be fairly brief. Is there anyone else who would like to? Uh, there's one here on my left, if we could, please. Just while we're waiting for the uh, microphone to go there, I would just remind the audience too of the Purbright foot and mouth disaster, which was uh, of a, a company and a government making, and who paid the cost then? The farming community. And I think that's something that just needs to be reminded of. Sir. Uh, Keith Meldrum, um, veterinary advisor to World Horse Welfare. I used to be chief veterinary officer in MAF some years ago. My concern about the proposal coming from government is whether it will work from day one. I am concerned about the, the fragmentation that is now occurring, the possible split of animal health and animal welfare, with animal health the state veterinary service in Worcester, the Scots and the Welsh and the Northern Irish not taking part in this at the present time, and the Commission coming later. I think we've got to have a system in place that is workable from day one, and this fragmentation to me, to me worries me immensely as to how you pull it all together in the face of disease. When you have a disease outbreak, it is imperative that you face that disease full front and that you don't spend too much time having to negotiate and liaise with various people who are spread out over the whole country. It is not the best system, in my opinion, to deal with a disease outbreak, and I hope the advisory committee will look at it from that viewpoint. Thank you. Keith, well done. Uh, there's no one who can speak with uh, more experience and wise words. That's great. Thank you very much, Keith. I'm going to close.